Well, I, 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 I need to tell you, Paul, I, I just was talking to somebody yesterday and they were asking about our church. And uh, it was a thrill to be able to say how much we appreciate you as part of our church family. Uh, and so I appreciate you appreciating me, and I want to let you know that we really, really appreciate you. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting on Sunday mornings uh, in my house because Sunday mornings can be a difficult time um, getting the kids up. Unfortunately for my wife, it's her responsibility to do that because I'm not in the house really. So I don't have that interruption. She does. And interruptions can be a very, very difficult thing in our life. Uh, Recently, our president came down with COVID-19. Not good. Not good. Especially for a president who is less than a month away from voting day. The debates planned, the confirmation of a Supreme Court judge nominee, loved by some, hated by others. Uh, and on a side note, it amazes me that the reason she's despised by others is because of her religious bent. Uh, and beliefs, but that's our country right now. Uh, my point is, it's an incredible inconvenience for him. It's an incredible, horrible timing for our president to get sick. I can't imagine he was happy. I can't imagine he was nonchalant about how unhappy he was. I'm guessing he was angry, frustrated, asking the question, why now? And a whole lot of other, other emotions probably were piled in there, but it happened. The interruption happened. And so he and we have no other choice but to deal with the interruptions when they interrupt us. My life is filled with interruptions. I don't know about yours. Inconveniences, frustrations, unexpected events. Things break, especially with five kids. Accidents happen, and especially with five kids. Uh, people get sick. Relationships take the wrong turns. Things get said, and it interrupts our lives, and our plans get changed. Where the phone rings just as you climb into bed, and on the other end it says, on the other end it says, Hi, this is the Yorktown Police Department. And I don't know whether to be angry or worried. One word usually comes to mind, Nate, but I'm just saying. Sometimes Josh. Or hi, it's the Plattsburgh Hospital. Then I know it's one word, Nate. It's an interruption. It's a frustration. It's an anger. It's unknowing. It's, it makes life stop a little bit. Interruptions. I, you know, maybe they're simpler interruptions. Traffic and road construction makes you late to work. And that's difficult for any of us that don't work online. And then just when you feel like you've gotten your finances under wraps, your car breaks down. Wow, I wasn't expecting that interruption. An unexpected illness changes your carefully crafted plans. Things that you had in stone in your daytime. Suddenly they have to be changed because your life was interrupted. You may be like us this past week. Our, one of our sons was, uh, I guess a week and a half ago, was supposedly on a bus to Bosis, in which a boy had been who tested positive for COVID. We never got a call from the school, so we, we assumed that it wasn't the same bus that he was on. But those children's families whose kids happened to be on the same bus 
suddenly had to quarantine for two weeks. Can you imagine that's, what that's like when you work? Not online. No work, no paycheck. No paycheck, no bills paid. That's not good. That's an interruption. Frustration. Anger. And we could go on and on. Interruptions are a part of everyone's life. Big or small. The problem is, I usually don't handle these interruptions in my life well. How about you? I often react with frustration or anger, and now here is my key. <laughs> See, that's how I feel on the inside, but I don't always show it on the outside. So it looks like I'm handling my interruptions okay. And unless you live at home with me, and then you see, no, I don't. Bad but true. Just the other day, I had some guy that was driving in front of me. As you know, I'm a driving instructor. And this guy was stopped at a stop street, making a right onto a main road. And he had so many gaps. I felt like we were sitting there for five minutes. And finally, I was getting so irritated inside. I said, come on, buddy, you had a million chances. Now, see, I say the word buddy because it sounds better. I even say that to myself. But that's not necessarily what I mean, if you know what I mean. I was impatient. I was angry. You know, until he turned the corner and I saw that it was a previous student. <laughs> Actually, no, that's not the truth. Uh, I have no idea who it was. I don't even know if it was a man or a woman. But when we have interruptions like that, sometimes we're like a kid. We just stomp our feet and we say, that's not fair. And sometimes we blame others for inconveniencing us. Uh, sometimes we throw our own pity parties. Small frustrations and interruptions, as well as the big ones, give us opportunities to rely on God. And that's the truth. Through these interruptions, though these interruptions are unexpected, they catch us off guard, they don't catch you. God. They're not random. They're not meaningless events. In fact, the interruptions are often divinely placed in our path for a reason. God uses these interruptions to change us to become more like Christ. To change us and our thinking into maybe believing in Him. Because some don't. So a little interruption shakes your world a bit. Makes you think, hmm, maybe God really does exist. Maybe he really does love me. Maybe he really is involved in my life. Slow traffic. Uh, a sick kid. A costly car repair, re repair. It might not seem like an important tool that God would use for our, our sanctification, which means growing and becoming more and more like Christ. We often overlook these interruptions, these inconveniences, and instead expect God to work in our lives through the huge, life-changing interruptions or circumstances. Did you hear that? It almost seems like a contradiction. We expect him to work through the big things, but not the little things. But the reality is we often won't have major events in our life that cause us to trust God and obey him in some deeply profound way. We won't be called uh, to build an ark or to march up with our only son to Mount Mora like Abraham was. It, it, it's in these small frustrations and interruptions 
in the little things of our life where we have the opportunities to rely on God, to obey Him, to, to bring Him glory, to understand who He is so we can understand who we are. A guy by the name of Paul Tripp, put it like this. You and I don't live in a series of big, dramatic moments. We don't careen from big decision to big decision. We all live in an endless series of little moments. The character of a life isn't set in 10 big moments. The character of a life is set in 10,000 little moments of every day. It's the themes of struggles that emerge from these little moments that reveal what's really going on in our hearts. Interruptions of grace. These 10,000 little moments come in the form of our, 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 our kids asking us to play a game with them when we're tied up with something else or when we're interrupted in what we feel was an important conversation to ask a simple question or to answer a simple question. There are moments when we get stuck behind a school bus and we're already late for an appointment. The nerve of the school bus. I was behind the van coming here this morning. The nerve of him. He was driving the speed limit. Don't we feel like that? Little interruptions. They reveal who we really are. The moments throughout the days when things don't get our, go our way, when our plans fail, when our life is interrupted. These are the moments where the rubber meets the road, where our faith is stretched. Or is it stretched? Do you let it be stretched? In those moments, are you standing on a rock or are you standing on sand? Uh, we, do we really believe that God is in control of the details of our lives? Do we really believe that uh, His grace is sufficient to get us through the day? That's what the Bible says. Do we really buy into it? Do we really believe that Jesus Christ is powerful enough not only to save us from eternity, but to sustain us and strengthen us in the midst of our interruptions each and every day. Do we really buy that? Do we really believe that Christ is enough to satisfy the deepest needs of our hearts? Do we stand on the fact that he is who he said he was and that we can have a personal relationship with him? Or do we think that's just a bunch of religious children? Are we standing on sand? And if we are, are we sinking in it? Or you get a solid rock going on? These interruptions are acts of God's grace. They force us to work through these questions. They make us face our own sin. They are God's way of taking off our blinders and making us see that we need Jesus Christ in our lives every day. They're the light that shines in the dark places of our hearts and of our minds. Those places that we don't like other people to see. We keep it dark. Because it's kind of ugly. These acts of grace, these interruptions that are given to us by God, they turn the light on in those dark places. They reveal the truth of what's really there. Those, those sins, pet sins, those little idols that we've kind of pushed off in the corner into the darkness. Because if we can't see them, then they must not exist, right? And what they do. And one of them is called ready. Our plans. Our plans. My plans. I don't really care about your plans, God. These are my plans for my life. So these interruptions are the reminder we need. What most of us don't want. These interruptions remind us that we don't have life figured out and that we can't do it on our own. They're kind of like a shepherd's staff, you know, at least shepherds in 
the old biblical days where they would have the big staff and the, the sheep would start to wander off and they'd take that crook of that staff and pull that lamb back. We need interruptions like that because we tend to stray. Like nothing else, they, they, they push us to the cross of Christ. They remind us that Jesus Christ gave his life for us, that he supplies grace and forgiveness for those who embrace him. It's a reminder that we need. Now here's a phrase, and I want you to grab hold of this. Christ cares more about our transformation than about our daily it's hard to see the little frustrating events and interruptions in our day as divinely placed opportunities, but they are. And, and seeing them as that helps us take our eyes off of ourselves and put them onto Christ, who cares more about our transformation than our daily comfort. He wants us to become better, not bitter. So rather than giving us a life of ease, he interrupts our lives with his grace and he shows us who we need most of all, and that is him. How about you? Is your life filled with interruptions? Do you see God's hand at work? And then for the next several weeks, I'm going to talk about interruptions, big ones and more importantly, little ones, because those are the ones we all deal with on a daily basis. But for today, I just want to end with uh, the next, next few minutes and talking about some of the big events, the big interruptions that stop us in our tracks, that really cause us to assess our lives. And they can be brutal and they can put an, uh, an immediate halt to everything going forward. When 9-11 hit, I was in Cancun with my wife and friends. Great place to be, right? Yeah, it wasn't. Because we couldn't get back in touch with the United States for numerous days. All we knew is the towers were gone. And me and my wife and my friend sat in front of the TV for three days straight looking at all the names of people that died that we may have known. I was trying to get in touch with my parents, who my kids were at my parents' house and Margaret's parents' house, and we couldn't get through. We couldn't get through to friends. It was, it was scary. It was a big interruption. And even though we were in Cancun, and that sounds wonderful, it wasn't. Most of my friends, it ends up, had miraculous stories. Some of them, their car died that morning. One of them had his shift changed dramatically. Another good friend of mine, uh, a month before, he suddenly was shifted to mid-Manhattan, to the Bronx, police officer. He was upset. A month later, his partner was on the 103rd floor and died. One guy I knew, um, he had a profound change in his life, as did his kids and his wife. Uh, his in-laws and wife were a part of my church that I was at in Peekskill. And I saw Todd regularly when he visited his family in Portland. And Todd happened to be on Flight 93 that Tuesday morning. You see, he was married to Lisa, who grew up in my church, and, and Todd was just a good, down-to-earth guy. I never really got to know him that well, just because, well, he lived down in New Jersey, I lived in Peekskill, but he always seemed like the kind of guy I, I would have really gotten along with. I really liked him, and it was always good to see him when he was visiting family. That night, he opted, as they came back from vacation, him and the family, instead of leaving Monday night, the day that they returned home, he would spend Monday night with his family, and he would take the early 
morning flight, Tuesday, 9-11. But that was flight 93. And that got hijacked and headed toward the White House instead. And that's when Todd Beamer and several other people on the plane planned and charged the cockpit to take control of the flight. Todd was able to get a hold of a rate, an operator on the phone, the plane phone. He had her recite the Lord's Prayer with him, and then as he got off the phone and he and his friends now stormed the cockpit, you can hear very clearly Todd's voice, let's roll. And it had become a saying, the president used it after that, and you have seen it throughout the years. That was Todd's words. That's, that's what he said when he and his wife were getting the kids off and they were going to the park. Let's roll. That was part of him. And it went down in a Pennsylvania field going over 500 miles an hour, all with him. And Lisa, his wife, was tragically interrupted. And I think that qualifies as a big interruption. I can't even imagine what she went through, how her life and plans were dramatically altered. Here she was pregnant with a third child, two kids, husband's now dead. But I do know that she showed class, strength, belief, and godliness in the days and the months that followed. And I can't imagine that God didn't just alter her plans and life in such a dramatic way without establishing her plan, his plans in and through her life because she had a willingness to lean on him. And he did. He used her power. He used Todd's life power. I have an old friend named Matt. Matt and I, well, I had the privilege of teaching with Matt for about 15 years at Hudson Valley Christian Academy. He taught health, I taught phys ed. Matt broke his neck playing rugby in a men's league. So then, in his early 40s with four little girls, he was living as a quadriplegic suddenly. And it dramatically altered his life. How he did it, I have no idea. Matt is a, Matt's amazing to me. I think he would be the first person to tell you that everything he's been able to endure and go through is because of the grace of God. Matt, you see, loves Jesus. But no, make no mistake, his life was dramatically altered, dramatically interrupted. How could it not be? And I'm sure God changed his plans. And I know that it drew Matt into a relationship with God that only an interruption like that could do. That's what the big interruptions do. They put a halt to life. Mary and Joseph were a young couple engaged to be married. She was younger, probably still in her teens. They lived in a very conservative religious community and family. So getting pregnant when one was not married didn't just happen then. And if it did, things never went well, especially for the young lady. Especially for the girl. Talk about being interrupted. Mary and Joseph had to carry the truth about their son in secret. Mary was told, you're going to be pregnant. What did she say? God, I can't be pregnant. I didn't do the, the thing. Mary, I'm going to... It's from the Holy Spirit. I mean, can, can you imagine Joseph? Mary's pregnant. Yeah, but we, 
We didn't do the, the thing, God. She, she must have cheated. Can you imagine how he struggled with that? Mary, really? An angel? God? I know how the birds and bees work, Mary. You're pregnant. It's not my kid. Can you imagine the interruption in his very well-rehearsed plans and life? He had it all orchestrated, as I'm sure she did. They were going to grow up. He was going to become a carpenter. They're going to have a wonderful family, just like other people. That didn't happen. Huge interruption. Can you imagine the words that were spoken about her as she walked down the road? Hey, not a huge community. People talk. Gossip flows. Can you imagine how he was treated? Joseph, come on. Divorce her. There's no other choice. Their worlds were shaken. Their plans severely interrupted. Their lives were changed. Confusion, disillusionment, big interruptions do that to us. Big interruptions are never anticipated, rarely welcomed, never convenient. They knock us off our feet. They seem impossible to overcome, and they cause us to feel hopeless and helpless, but they also force us to our knees like nothing else. And they cause us to admit that we can't handle what's in front. And that might sound a scary place to be, but that is the best place to be. Because you've got no other choice but to look up. And so I'm going to give you the first three letters of what I'm going to be covering over the next few weeks. And it's refocus is the word that I want you to get in your mind. Refocus. And I'm going to use the letters R-E today because I couldn't think of anything that came with E. And so... RE, uh, refocus. Uh, we'll cover uh, one more letter today, and then I'll do the rest uh, in weeks to come. Uh, first thing uh, that I, this antidote for dealing with life's interruptions is to refocus. Uh, number one, these interruptions allowed by God, they cause us to look at Him they, and, and refocus our dependence. Not on our plans or our abilities, but onto him. And that's the problem that a lot of us have. You see, we're confident. We're, we're focused on our abilities and our plans. And then when suddenly God puts that interruption there, we're messed up. Because we don't know how to deal with that. And so these interruptions are divinely planted, allowed by God, to cause us to look to him. To refocus our dependence upon him. And not our plans or abilities. And God allows. And allows is a key word here. Allows. Because he's behind those interruptions, regardless if we think maybe we are. <laughs> he's allowed them into our lives to refocus us. For some of us, we don't need the re part because, well, let's be honest, we've never been focused from the very beginning. So we don't need a refocus. We need to focus for the first time. Some of you don't have a relationship with Christ. You, you just think of it as religion. Yeah, you need to start to focus on what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ not just be a religious person, because those are two dramatically different things. It's kind of like how a car loses its alignment at points, and it needs to be realigned. Well, some of us, our car, we've, over the course of time, our focus has gotten distracted from Jesus Christ onto other things, namely our plans, our abilities, and we need to be realigned. So we need an interruption. 
God is so gracious to give us one. I think of what he did for a guy named Saul on the road to Damascus, where he was going to persecute Christians, because that was his job, because he was a religious dude that really took that to heart. And his plans and his we were to go to Damascus and persecute these Christians, drag them out by their hair, throw them in jail, kill them if I had to. And he was interrupted by God on that road to Damascus. And God changed this guy's name from Saul to Paul. And he became the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. And he completely changed the Roman Empire. And that's why he could write what he did in Romans chapter 8, 28, 31, 32, 35, 39. He said, and we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have called, been called according to his purpose. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or death or anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. A man changed by a big interruption. God also allows these big interruptions not only to focus us to his ways and his will instead of getting stuck on our own. And many of us live this way. We're stuck in our own plans. We don't know how to let God lead our life. We, are, we have our plans and they have to go forward and onward. And sometimes the only way for God to get our attention is for a big interruption to come into our lives. Think of how he took a teenage boy and interrupted his life so dramatically that he ended up becoming the savior of the family and his people and the second in command of all of Egypt. And God gave Joseph such a soft heart, the ability to see God's hand in the interruption. And he saw it so freely that he gave freely his love and forgiveness for his brothers who sold him into slavery and wanted to kill him. Joseph needed the interruption to become the man God wanted him to be. Isaiah 55, 80 says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. And that is the truth. And thirdly, of course, God allows these great interruptions into our lives to provide for us. To provide for us. I can remember years ago, we were building an addition on our house. And I came home early on a Thanksgiving while Margaret was with the kids down at her parents. I came home to work on the house. And imagine my surprise when I walked in the back door of this kitchen that was totally ripped apart. And it was raining while it was sunny outside. How does that happen? Well, a broken radiator on the third floor would make that happen. Who knew how long it had been pouring down through the third floor, which was completely removed, into or below the, 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 the radiator was the floorboards that were not sealed. And so the water was going down into the only bedroom that my wife and I were able to sleep in. And the water was pouring down onto the bed through those floorboards that were not sealed into our basement where we had all of our clothes and everything in bags and bins. And 
Water was pouring down, then it was working its way around the basement to the only other bed that we had in the house, which happened to be a huge futon at that point. My kids were very small than they are now, and they all slept, four of them, on that futon bed. So now there was a, a foot of water in the basement. Oh my gosh. I called up Margaret, you better, you better stay for two more days. And I remember going to work that morning, and I'm just saying, consider all joy time. Consider it all joy. How do I do it? Consider it, okay, all right. Consider it all joy, Lord. Consider it all joy. I just get, that was my mantra the whole day. I came home, ripped up the rug, pulled off the sheetrock, got the water out. Wow, that was devastating. Big interruption for us. Little did I know that in six months, we would run out of money. What do you do when you have the, hat, the, the addition half done and you got no more money? Imagine my surprise when Margaret comes up the stairs, we're on now, and says, you know what? I happened to be on the phone with our insurance agent, just happened to mention the flood. And they said, oh, homeowners is going to cover that. They're sending an adjustment, an adjuster out to look at the damage. Do you know that we received enough money to finish our fishing? Six months after the big adversity. And God allows sometimes these things into our life that make no sense. And we ask why to provide for us. And it might be not then and there. It might be months down the road. And that leads me to my conclusion and the last letter F, the F in refocus. For some of us, when our plans go south, we tend to lean on another F word. And that's not good. There's a reason they call it the F bomb. Not supposed to say it. But our F word's a little bit different. It's faith. Have faith in God and his word. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Trust in him. Have faith in him. That means no matter what the situation looks like, you have faith in the fact that God, Jesus Christ, has your back. Not based on your plans, Rather the fact that he knows what's best for you and you're going to trust him in whatever comes down the pipe. And it says, with all your heart, have faith when, have faith that he knows what he's doing and you don't have to doubt that he has your best plans in store. Even if your knowledge seems to say a little bit more the opposite. Trust in him with all your heart. And don't lean on your understanding because we have come to a place where we are egotistical and we constantly lean on our understanding and you cannot, I cannot possibly understand God and his ways. He's up to something when there's an interruption and he is going to have his way and we can choose to lean on our understanding or trust him, have faith in him and his ways. And then he said, in all your ways. Does that mean that we can't have our own ways, our own plans? No, it means we can, but we just don't lean on them. We don't put our full weight on them. Instead, and in spite of that, uh, our, our not understanding, we choose to have faith in him. We choose to lean on his understanding, his ways, not ours. And he says, acknowledge him in the plans. Have faith that his plans are to give you a hope and a future. That's what he says in in uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So we trust in that. And as we refocus on his plans and surrender ours, which I know is a tough thing because we think we know what's best for us. Nevertheless, when you acknowledge him, when you give him your plans, he says, and it's a promise, I will give you a hope and a future and a path that is straight. It doesn't make sense to a lot of people that we have faith in a God that died on the cross. To them it seems foolish. But to us, 
who choose to believe. It is the power of God in our lives. So, we celebrate communion each week just to remind us of what Christ did at the cross. And as we do that this morning, uh, if you have a relationship with Christ, focus in on it. Focus in on the interruptions that he's allowed into your lives. Are you making use of them or are you fighting against?